record banter. We'll start. Okay, so welcome everyone to this webinar on Stop the Cowboy Lenders. Um, I'm Dario Kenner and I work at CAFOD. Um, and we are hosting this webinar with Debt Justice, who we've been working with very closely for several years now uh, on this uh, really crucial area. So we're going to start with um, a few different uh, speakers, but I'm just going to give a quick overview. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are already aware of this. You've been uh, campaigning on this issue with us, uh, following it with us. So clearly there's a global debt crisis, and um, that is currently uh, obviously undermining our efforts to uh, deal with the climate crisis at the same time. Countries have fewer resources to um, uh, fund mitigation, adaptation, et cetera. And there's a summit this week in Paris uh, hosted by uh, President Macron, uh, but we're not expecting really uh, many solutions from that summit. And that's why uh, CAFOD and Debt Justice and others have been campaigning for a law in the UK, uh, which would hopefully be replicated in places like the United States, and that would force private creditors, who would be a real block on debt relief, to come to the table. Um, but for that, we will hear more from Tim at Debt Justice. He'll start us off. Uh, to talk about why that law is needed. Then we'll hear from Mahmoud uh, from Barbados, who will be talking about things like reparations. And then finally, we'll hear from Precious, who's a youth climate activist from Zambia, about why we need to cancel debt and why that's so important to tackle the climate crisis. And then at the very end, we'll hear from Heidi, who's the executive director at Debt Justice, um, about what we can do with the current campaign. So I'll pass over to Tim, if that's okay. Hi everyone, uh, it's great to be with you this evening. So my name's Tim Jones. I'm head of policy at Debt Justice in the UK. And as Dario says, we've um, been campaigning for many years for debt cancellation, cancellation of unjust and unsustainable debts, and for measures to try and prevent debt crises causing um, chaos for people and countries. Unfortunately, we've got a very um, dangerous, worrying debt situation for many countries in the world. For um, countries across Africa, the Caribbean, Latin America and Asia, debt payments are at the highest level they have been at for 25 years, so since 1998. And for those who have campaigned for many years, they'll know that um, following um, there was a big debt crisis in the 1980s and 1990s that caused um, huge problems. In the 2000s, some countries got some debt cancelled and other reasons led to those debt payments falling. But over recent years, they've now shot back up again. And the UN estimates that 54 countries around the world are now in a debt crisis where debt payments having um, such a big impact that they're undermining the ability of governments to meet the basic needs of their population. Why has this happened? So following the financial crisis in the Western world 15 years ago, interest rates in the West were very low. And that meant that bank speculators wanted to lend elsewhere in the world where they felt they could charge much higher interest rates. And so there was a boom in lending as these um, speculators sought to lend at high interest rates to um, countries across the global south. And we're um, talking, this is interest rates of 6 to 10% at the same time as governments like the UK or the US were able to borrow at 0 or 1% interest. So there's this big boom of lending. And then over the last few years, we've had this succession of um, impacts that have made the debt situation much worse. Obviously, the COVID pandemic, energy and food price increases, now interest rate increases. And in efforts to try and keep paying these debts, that's had big impacts on social spending. Zambia, um, whilst it was um, keeping up with debt payments, cut spending on social services by one fifth, by 20 percent. 
In Pakistan, they spend six times more on debt payments that leave the country than on healthcare. But then another underlying reason why this crisis has arisen is the climate emergency. When, and we'll hear a lot more about this, when countries are hit by climate disasters, because there is no compensation um, in place from richer countries that have caused the emergency, they have to borrow to recover. Um, in 2010, Pakistan was hit by um, devastating floods. And we've shown that they therefore, as a result, because they didn't get grants to help deal with the impacts, they had to borrow between an extra 20 to $40 billion in order to recover from those floods. Uh, and because countries are so heavily indebted, they don't have funds to invest in preparing for the worsening climate impacts we're seeing and um, measures to deal with it. Now, I've talked generally about um, these um, boom in lending. So who are these lenders? Well, there are internationally a range of different kinds of um, people who have lent money. The um, biggest group is private companies who lend at the highest interest rates. That includes banks, but also hedge funds, oil trading companies, uh, and things called asset managers. And they now account for half of the debt payments of lower income countries. 30% of those countries' debt payments are to institutions like the IMF and World Bank and 20% uh, to other governments, the largest of which is China, which gets mentioned a lot. Um, but then there are other governments as well, like Japan and France, that lend quite a bit of money. Now, these private lenders gave these high interest loans, and they said they were charging such high interest because of the supposed risk. So they said, we think we might not get repaid this, so that's why we're going to charge you 10% when we're only charging the UK government 1%. Over recent years, that risk has happened. We've had unprecedented sets of risks of COVID and price rises and interest rate increases and the climate emergency. And now that that's happened, these private lenders have refused to take part in debt relief. At the start of the COVID pandemic, there was an international agreement to offer a suspension of debt payments for 70 countries. And governments took part in that. So China suspended debt payments. The UK did for the little bit of debt that was owed to the UK. The private lenders refused. Um, since then, a debt relief scheme was also created by um, the G20 group of self-appointed most important countries. And the countries that have applied for that are still waiting for getting any debt relief. Zambia, Chad, Ethiopia and Ghana have all um, applied and private lenders have all so far refused to cancel any debts. Now, often with these private lenders, although we know how much debt is owed to them, we don't know who all the companies are. There's a big lack of transparency as to who ultimately owes owns the debt. One we do know of is a company called BlackRock. You may or may not have heard of it. It's one of the largest financial companies in the world. It manages over a trillion dollars of um, assets. And we've managed to um, work out that if they are paid in full by Zambia, they'll make 110% profit on what they paid for the debt that they've bought. So much of the debt they've bought is actually, they didn't lend the money originally. They've bought up debts when Zambia was unable to pay and they then stand to make big profits if Zambia paid them in full. As Dario mentioned, this week there is a um, summit in France, France discussing tweaks to the financial system, mostly ways to give more loans to countries. And this has been led by France with little inclusion of countries from the global south. And if, um, if you take a step back in the 1980s and 1990s, when the last time there was such a wave of debt crises um, across many countries, what happened was that the people who'd lent the money originally, which was largely banks, were bailed out because people like the IMF and World Bank lent more money 
and that paid off those debts. And they forced countries to introduce austerity, which had horrific results in those countries. And potentially the same thing could happen again now, that if these international discussions respond to a debt crisis by just focusing on how to lend more money and respond to the climate emergency by just discussing how to lend more money, that money will be used to pay off these private lenders, but just leave countries trapped in debt. And so we need to this time make the private lenders take part in debt relief rather than bailing them out because it's the morally right thing to do because countries need it and also to prevent future crises. So one of the reasons why we've ended up back in the same situation again is because these private lenders expect to be bailed out and so they keep then lending recklessly. And so you get this cycle of debt crises continually taking place. Now I'm talking from the UK and I know many people on the call uh, in the UK and the UK um, is a relatively insignificant country globally, but bizarrely it has a massive impact on how the international debt system works. Uh, of the countries that are eligible for the G20 debt relief scheme, 90% of the um, debts that they owe to private lenders are governed by UK law. What that means is that creditors can sue the country in the UK if the debtor stops paying. It also means that the UK can set the rules around how debts are negotiated including ensuring that private lenders take part in debt relief. And there's actually precedent for this, we've done it before. So in the 2000s, there was a debt relief scheme for 40 countries. And in 2010, we got the UK to pass a law which um, ensured that private creditors had to give the same amount of debt relief as the public creditors like governments and the IMF and World Bank had done. And that law has set a very important precedent as to how to make private lenders take part in debt relief. It only applies to that past debt relief scheme, so it doesn't help countries now, but it sets that precedent. So what the UK could do and what we would like and what our Stop Cowboy Lenders campaign is calling for is for a new law that requires private creditors to take part in the debt relief schemes that exist today. There are two um, possible ways this could um, be done. One is like um, replicates the 2010 law and says that um, private um, creditors have to give as much debt relief as public creditors have, like governments. Or another route um, would be that there are actually rules exist in the UK law for cancelling debts of companies. Um, which allow a debtor to negotiate with all their creditors and if they get enough to agree they can then get the court to enforce the others to all agree to cancel um, enough debt to um, to get it down to a sustainable level so these two options for laws um, we think actually, ideally both um, would be helpful for different reasons um, but there are precedents with the law we got passed in 2010 or how debts of companies are treated in the UK that could be used uh, to um, pass these laws which would give debtors much more power to make the private creditors cancel their debts when they're unable to pay. There are also two other legal things that could be done. One is to prevent um, creditors suing a country when it is in a debt relief process, which would again increase their um, power in negotiations because um, no creditor could um, tr um, try and stop them from defaulting and taking away um, that power in negotiations. And another thing is transparency, requiring um, loans to be made public when they're given. Debts to governments by their nature should all be public, should be there for citizens to be able to scrutinize the loans that are being given and how the money is being spent. But actually the private loans are the most secret in the world. There was a scandal a few years ago that's still having horrendous impacts in Mozambique where banks in London lent money secretly that was mostly stolen and has caused a huge debt crisis. But across the board, 
these loans from private companies are very untransparent. We don't know who the main lenders are. We don't know the interest rates they're being given at. And we don't know until a couple of years later that a loan is even being given. And so um, making lenders be transparent is another thing the UK could do. Since we launched the campaign, we've had um, some big impacts. The International Development Committee of the UK Parliament have called for the law to be passed. The Labour Party front bench spokespeople have asked the government to consider it. And actually, the um, development minister, Andrew Mitchell, gave a vaguely positive response to that. And we've also had lots of positive responses from opposition MPs. The other place in the world which is important for this um, idea of passing legislation is New York because the contracts that aren't governed by UK law are governed by New York law and there they've actually got a draft bill that has been um, introduced in the New York Assembly it got significant support they didn't quite manage to get it to a vote a few weeks ago but hopefully in the next year they will and that's a realistic prospect that New York could pass legislation and between um, our efforts this international development committee the New York campaign there has been media coverage across the world of um, these the idea of legislating to make private creditors take part in debt relief in place like the Financial Times, The Guardian, Reuters and Bloomberg. So this campaign is very urgent, countries are going through this crisis right now, um, but we're also in it for the long haul that we're building the case, building a support and building across parties in the UK to try and get um, the support we need for this legislation. And the more realistic we make this legislation, the more likely it is to happen, the more private creditors will be pressured to take part in debt relief right now for countries that are negotiating right now, like Zambia. So we're making progress. Um, it, Debt Justice and allies we're working with, like CAFOD, um, we really need to keep the pressure up, get more MPs um, interested in the idea, aware of it, and making public statements in support. Thank you. Okay, um, that's brilliant. Thank you so much, Tim. That was really clear. You're, you're so good at explaining really complicated <laughs> subjects um, in such a clear way, even if when we meet with uh, civil servants at the Treasury, even though it's so clear, they, they still don't want to, uh, to do what we want them to do, which is why we need to carry on um, campaigning and keep up the pressure, as you said. So we're now going to pass to Mahmoud Patel, who's in Barbados. He's a coconut farmer and activist. And uh, Mahmoud, it would be great to, to hear from you. Um, I think you're currently on mute um, about yeah how, uh, how debt has affected communities in, in Barbados and what you're campaigning on and yeah how uh, like citizens in the UK can 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 campaign in solidarity with with communities uh, on the front line of the climate crisis so over to you Mahmoud. Good, good evening and good afternoon here in the Caribbean um, my name is Mahmoud Patel I am a regenerative agroforestry farmer in Barbados. I plant a lot of coconut trees and um, in some ways trying to replant all the biodiversity, the flora biodiversity that we have lost since sugarcane monoculture. Actually, to highlight the crisis that we have, we are actually having a hurricane, Brett, about several hundred kilometers to the east of us. And if I sound a bit nervous, is because we will probably have a huge storm tomorrow afternoon, and I don't know what damage is going to cause in the actual forest. But I'd like to, to maybe change the conversation slightly into going to a more tactile, um, as a farmer, um, presentation about how this debt and the climate emergency affects us on a very physical, tactile level. Um, the climate emergency started with the development of plantation economies and the deforestation of the lands in the Caribbean, of the Caribbean and the Americas. One can say the industrial revolution at the root of this climate crisis and the banking system that it created was funded by the exploitation of monoculture economies such as sugarcane in Barbados. Um, 
I see the legacy, or I can still see the legacy in the actual soil and topography that we work. Cocoa Hill Forest, is which are the forest that we work on, is beautiful to look at. But when you scratch the surface, you can see the trauma of history, how this land has been exploited and sterilized. The land is scarred by hundreds of years of colonial monoculture extraction. And for me, sugarcane is the same thing as mining oil or bauxite. It is, it's taking all the resources out and putting back in nothing. Um, so the land is scarred by hundreds of years of, colo of, of, of colonial monoculture extraction, which has continued to this day. So leading to the loss of our topsoil, soil infertility, which then creates mud flows and land abandonment. Barbados had primordial forests, and its forests used to produce everything which the indigenous inhabitants needed. But now, for whatever reason, we are importing almost 85% of our food, which is unsustainable. I like to say that the Europeans, the Spanish, the English, the French, and the Dutch built their empires through the exploitation of these resources and peoples, starting with the Caribbean and then the Americas, then Africa and Asia. Sugarcane, and the plantation economy it spawned generated so much wealth in Barbados. At one time, we were called the, the gem in the English crown. Um, that the model, this model that was copied in Barbados was replicated in the Carolinas and then North America. Huge wealth generated by dedicating Barbados to producing one crop, sugarcane, for export, export. And that wealth, a part of that wealth, helped to create the industrial revolution and development in Europe. Barbados is one of the few places in the world where the entire land space was planted, plantationized for sugarcane. And that came at the expense of all of our um, biodiversity and also even domestic food production. So one can argue, also argue that psychologically, the 400 years of monocrop also created a dependency culture for imported food and solutions. The climate crisis, the, no, the climate crisis also brings change in rail form patterns. It's also bringing sargassum seaweed, droughts, and then devastating hurricanes. These costs mount, and the result is that we get deeper and deeper in debt to the countries that colonized us and exploited us in the first place. As a result, Barbados is in a serious debt crisis. The colonial authorities did not really invest in any kind of developed economy prior to independence. And then at independence, we actually have a, what I would call a dysfunctional civil service, a slightly broken education, education system, and we don't have the means to get out of debt. We are not considered poor enough to have, like, to have cheap loans and grants from international institutions. So we have to borrow at high interest rate from private lenders on the international finance market. When we are hit by drought, pandemic, or hurricane, rising food prices or interest rates, it becomes difficult to keep making these payments. Our public debt is about 140%, 150% of our GDP. And it makes us, it's the highest level, we're probably the highest level in the Caribbean and I'm definitely among the highest in the world. This means that we have, as a country, to spend a large part of our revenue on paying creditors. Our debt payments are higher than our spending on healthcare. And this is despite an IMF, International Monetary Fund program, that has imposed significant cuts to public services. The COVID pandemic, then sent our debt levels right back up again. So we have now had to suffer austerity policies before solving the debt crisis. The Caribbean as a whole is experiencing a silent debt crisis, as well as we are on the front line of a huge climate emergency. The, S the IMF austerity program means that we don't have wriggle room to spend on developmental projects or developing our infrastructure. The government simply doesn't have resources to invest in 
agriculture, in upgrading our water system, our infrastructure, or you know, help to resolve our food insecurity through regenerative agricultural projects. Before Barbados's independence, there was no real development to create a sustainable economy. We were a colony, meaning that we sent things to the center. So now we have to borrow funds to try to do that. We have to change our education system to make it more modern and more creative and more um, research and development oriented. But we don't have the funds to do that. We are stuck in a climate debt trap in which we have to borrow to pay for the damage caused by the climate emergency, as well as the inadequate infrastructure that is the legacy of colonialism. But the repayments and the huge interest rates drain our resources and prevent us from investing, not only, not only to be able to feed our people, but if we don't fix our structural challenges, we go further and further into a trap. This is, for me, in my opinion, this is a direct result of empire and wealth extraction to the colonial center. This legacy of debt is a threat to our sovereignty. And instead of inheriting transgenerational wealth, our children is inheriting transgenerational debt. I would like to say, at least metaphorically, we don't own a debt. We have already paid it in the blood, sweat, and tears our people have for centuries been given back to the center. That is my presentation and I thank, um, first of all, that justice for giving me this opportunity. Um, it's the first time I'm doing something like this. And I also like to say both um, coming from an Indian background and then a Caribbean person, we really see the tangible tactile effects of this huge injustice or this huge trap that as a farmer, we don't have good soil to plant food. How will we ever, ever be able to get out of this trap? Thank you. Thank you, Mahmoud. That was um, very, very powerful and great to hear from your personal experience um, as a farmer, how, it's, how this is impacting you and also your assessment, brilliant assessment. An analysis of, of what's happening at the broader more structural level as you said so many resources flowing from the global south to the global north we will now move uh over to precious uh kalamwana from uh youth climate activists from zambia and it'd be great to hear from you about the campaigning that you're doing and uh, the links that you are constantly making between debt justice and climate justice so over to you precious Hi everyone, uh, my name is Precious Kalumbwana. I'm a youth crime justice advocate in uh, Zambia and very passionate about uh, achieving debt and crime justice. I think I'll start with uh, why am I campaigning with, on debt cancellation? I can stay say that I'm protecting Zambia from climate change because my country is in a debt crisis. Zambia spends 30% of its national budget on debt repayments. It can't even afford to invest in renewable energy or adapt its infrastructure to cope with extreme weather. It also can't even afford to invest in basic public services like healthcare. That means ordinary people like me have been left severely at risk from a crisis I, did, I didn't cause. Debt cancellation is vital for Zambia. It's a matter of social, economic, and uh, climate justice. I also say the harm that the debt has caused in Zambia. The debt, the debt situation in Zambia has really affected our communities. It has increased our cost of living we can't afford to eat even uh, three times a day because of debt. We can't even find medicine in hospital or access good quality education because of debt. Just this year, more than 150,000 people were affected by floods. Loads, bridges, and homes were destroyed, preventing people from 
accessing schools, healthcare, and markets. Zambia needs and deserves date cancellation. In my own experience as a youth activist and why I became a youth activist, climate change is affecting everyone, regardless of the race, age, country, whether you're from global north or global south, climate, climate change is affecting everyone. In my situation as a parent, I have two children. I was affected by floods. I had to move at night because our house was flooded. The government and the, the MMDU didn't have uh, didn't have resources where they can take us. We were left homeless in 2021. And uh, and recently, just this year, my father was left homeless because of floods. I'm so scared because uh, I fear for tomorrow. So we really need debt cancellation for Zambia. It's very important for us so that we can enable a just transition. I also I also talk about uh, how BlackRock and other lenders are blocking this progress. It is very unfair for BlackRock and other lenders to make more profits out of our country in a debt crisis like this one. We urgently need all of the Zambians lenders, including Blacklock, to agree to cancel dates so that we can enable a just transition. Blacklock has caused more harm to our country. People are dying because there's no, there's no medicine in our hospitals. We can't even access good education because of dates. And uh, I'm very thankful for what the Global North countries that are doing because of the new registration that you are pushing. Thank you so much for that, what you're doing. The Global North countries, they're trying all the ways to fight for Global South countries so that the date is canceled. We are very thankful for that. Zambia needs and deserve date cancellation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Precious. Um, again, as uh, Mahmoud did for for yeah, really sharing your uh, experience of of what's happening, what you're seeing, um, and yeah, we we are fully aware of um, just how urgent all of this is. And as you as you said, you gave examples of lack of resources for for healthcare and and what that means for people's lives. So yeah, this. This, this is this is really urgent. Plus, on top of that, the flooding, as you mentioned, um, uh, as uh, Mahmoud said, uh, there's a hurricane on the way again, as as per usual in the Caribbean. So these are issues which are happening uh, frequently, and which is why we need uh, that structural change, which is we're referring this webinar is all about why we need legislation, for example, in the UK to get private creditors to participate. Please. Uh, in, in debt relief, please put your questions in the chat. I just wanted to ask one question of Tim uh, first to get things going, which is that uh, remarkably in New York, um, campaigners uh, like ourselves um, were a bit, would be pushing for a while and very nearly got a law, which is uh, not exactly in terms of technical side, what we may be pushing in the UK, but in terms of uh, trying to reduce that power asymmetry between countries in the global south and private creditors, like you mentioned, like, like BlackRock, that law would 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 have helped do that and to increase the chances of, of higher debt relief. So just maybe could you, Tim, just just explain um, it's it's a kind of sign of hope, but it didn't happen in the end. But as in how close it actually was uh, to actually get the kind of legislation that we're talking about in a key jurisdiction, which was New York, because as we know, a lot of debt is held under either New York law or uh, UK law. So maybe you could just explain that and, if, and briefly, that would be really helpful. Um, yeah, I can try. Um, and so the background is the um, of international debt contracts roughly of governments, roughly half and half are governed by New York law or English law. For it, um, 
the lower income countries, it tends to be more like that it's UK law um, of countries that are particularly um, going through um, debt negotiations at the moment. Zambia, Ghana um, are, have debts owed under UK law, also Pakistan, whereas Suriname and Sri Lanka have debts under New York law. So both New York and the UK are really important. The campaigners managed to get the law passed through one of the committees in the New York Assembly, um, but they didn't manage to get it introduced to the floor for a vote of the full um, New York Assembly. Um, there's lots of bills that try to get passed in a session and the um, New York Assembly is like it runs the New York State in the US, uh, but also it doesn't sit for that long each year. So they have a limited amount of time to get it passed. So yeah, unfortunately they got close. They managed to win a vote, but they didn't manage to get the um, bill passed in the end, but they can bring it back um, again um, next year to the session. And um, it has, um, it kind of further increased the publicity around this kind of legislation, I think helped in further putting pressure on private creditors that this is the kind of thing that's coming for them if they continue to be obstructive. Uh, so it's definitely um, shown some progress, um, as well as the things that we've had in the UK recently, like the International Development Committee report. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Tim. And there was just picking up on again why we're talking so much about this legislation. You, you mentioned something in in your um, in your presentation about trying to avoid this uh, this particular situation happening again. So this uh, cycle, this debt trap um, of of basically uh, in this case private creditors like hedge funds and asset managers being bailed out basically um, so that they continue to get paid while. Uh, everyone else suffers in in effect and i was just really struck by something that mahmoud uh, referred to which is um you know saying that actually the debt that barbados owes has already been paid many times over uh through you know blood sweat and tears and i just wondered mahmoud if you could maybe just reflect on that uh in a bit more detail because something which it's always important to remember um is that debt is political obviously it's not just a technical thing it's not just economic um but sometimes um if, if say tim or i are meeting uh civil servants from from our treasury or, or meeting um uh, staff from the world bank or imf they try to keep it technical you know they they try to keep it as this country say barbados owes the money they need to pay whereas actually it is political yeah, um, and so it's so crucial to 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 just oh restate God. as you said that the debt has already been paid and that you know to start off from that point and then discuss how to deal with uh the the existing debt so maybe if you could just reflect a little bit more on on the on that fact that it's yeah. already been paid who are who are the creditors and who are the debtors well i i would say you know that also has history Right, we, and, and I think sometimes what we do is we contextualize it in a two-dimensional construct. Barbados owns the IMF or, or UK banks or whatever, a hundred million dollars or let's say a billion dollars. But it's a historical construct or a narrative to this debt and how it's created in the first place. And it's based on power. Who had the power? Who has the power? And who lends the money? And who borrows the money? And at what terms are you borrowing? Because you obviously need to develop. But this power was constructed over hundreds of years of accumulation of at the end of a gun, um, mostly in the 1600s, 1700s, and 1800s, you know, literally at the end of a gun barrel. And I think sometimes that is, that is maybe, you know, not in the discourse, but that has history. And, and then, I mean, maybe, and then it, and it's connected to power. Because if I had the power not paying the debt, we wouldn't pay the debt. If all the, uh, the, uh, the third world economies or the developing worlds would get together one day and say, we're not paying the debt, because it's an equation, debt and uh, a credit and a debit. But then what would probably happen is that a Navy would sail down into Barbados waters, 
you know, at some army and, and have a discussion about some kind of occupation. So the history of that, I think, has to be taken into the discourse because we conveniently forget that this debt was built and this power structure or imbalanced power structure was built over a long period of time. How do we fix that? I am not sure. Uh, I've, I've never really liked the idea of a dollar repatriation, but I would think it needs some kind of help with restructuring the education system, restructuring the development challenges, restructuring the idea of developmental loans rather than interest rates. Maybe there's another conversation to have. I, I But I, I think the challenge with that that we keep forgetting is the historical line. In the background, you're going to be hearing rain. <laughs> it's coming. Okay, thank you, Mahmoud, uh, for that reminder as well of the uh, yeah living through the the climate emergency day to day. So, uh, just building on what uh, Mahmoud was was saying there about the the historical nature of this, um, I'm going to ask you, Precious, uh, about about these asymmetries in power and uh, well, yes, military might being used to uh, well to to impose that and then for it to be paid. What do you think about uh, reparations, Precious, uh, in terms of, um, well, that historical and colonial debt um, and also the climate debt and ecological debt? Do, do you have any anything to say about, about the need for reparations, uh, Precious? Uh, I think on that, I can say that uh, Zambia also needs the reparation. Since uh, Zambia got its independence, in uh, 1964, uh, through British, I think uh, we have uh, we have uh, we have uh, a weak economy. That uh, since then, until then, until now, we are still struggling with uh, with debt and everything. We need even restructure with our education and everything so that we can enable just transition. Yes. Thank you, Precious. Um, that that's great. And just reflecting on uh, what's happening this week, which is this this uh, uh, Paris summit on a uh, new financial pact, which, as we've uh, as several of us have, have mentioned, uh, is is being held. What what's uh, I mean, Tim's already uh, said that he's not expecting much to come out of it. I uh, just wondered if. Uh, Mahmoud, maybe you 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 had something to say about about this summit. I am not optimistic um, that anything purposeful will come out of these kinds of conversations. I know my prime ministers and Avinash Prasad, who is one of her big advisors, um, is pushing the idea of the Bridgetown Initiative. But again, I think it's one of a conversation between power and powerless. And I'm not sure how powerless can really affect any change uh, in any kind of meaningful way. Uh, personally, on a personal level, I dislike the idea of begging, um, uh, you know, in whatever form it takes. But I so I'm personally not optimistic, but I do think that the, the Bridgetown Initiative is a good start in some kind of conversation. Honestly, I don't have a, 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 a suggestion or a, a solution. It's it's a huge challenge or a huge problem. Um, but I, yeah, I'm not optimistic about these kinds of meetings. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Uh, having a summit doesn't mean under, I suppose, and uh, we know that uh, significant debt cancellation, tax justice, etc., are not really on on the agenda. Um, we've had a few questions, uh, which maybe I'll ask. I'll pass one over to Tim. Uh, this one here: Can we break the vicious circle of cycle, I guess, of banks and creditors being too big to fail uh, when they lend recklessly, knowing that they will be bailed out? So that's a tricky one. I'll pass over to Tim. Um, I think we can, but yeah, I think that is one of the things that we're fighting for. So 
um, what was what happened in the 1980s and 1990s was so devastating for so many countries. So at the start of the crisis, most of the debt was owed to private lenders, to banks, and then countries saying we can't pay. And that threatened those um, banks might have um, gone bankrupt, particularly on the loans from Latin America. And so the UK and US didn't want that to happen. So they got the IMF and World Bank to increase the amount they lend, which effectively paid those banks off and then forced austerity for the next um, 20 odd years, which was a um, catastrophic failure as um, both on its own terms, the um, GDP growth stalled, but in human terms, the increase in poverty, the lack of, lack of access to education and health services. And then when in the 2000s, we did manage to win some debt cancellation, it was all um, the debts that were cancelled were these debts now owed to the IMF, to the World Bank, to governments. And so it was the public sector that um, cancelled debts. We needed them to do it, but the private creditors had escaped with all their money. And so as long as that is the system for dealing with debt crises, it doesn't work, but it does also incentivize this continued cycle. So in trying to get um, make it clear that when debt problems arise when debts can't be paid the private creditors the original lenders have to pay then we're also trying to deal with the crises but also trying to prevent future crises as well and um, because it is um an appalling fact that for in the 2000s some countries including zambia did get a eventually um, a large amount of their debt cancelled but we're back in the same situation for some of those countries again because we haven't dealt with some of these underlying structural causes and there are many there's the colonialism the climate emergency unfair trade and tax rules but also the system of um, this incentivizing reckless lending keeps the cycle of crises going okay thank you tim and and i mean it's uh if we were to get this legislation in, in the UK or they nearly got it in New York, that would help to contribute to more of a structural change, wouldn't it? To try and avoid this happening again. It wouldn't guarantee it, but it but it but it would be a bit a big step forward. Um, I just want to ask uh, Precious uh the next question. So uh it's a question about um the particular role of governments who are in a debt crisis. So I imagine you would want to talk about Zambia, but you could talk about uh, other countries if you wanted to. Um, and the question was about, are they calling for debt cancellation? And if not, uh, why not? So perhaps you'd like to talk about the Zambian government's position uh, in relation to, to, to debt relief and to the debt restructuring that it's currently negotiating with its creditors. Uh, I think you can, you can repeat your question. Sorry, it was it was to ask about what what is the Zambia is the Zambian government calling for debt cancellation as part of its negotiations with its creditors right now? Uh, yes, for now our government is calling for debt cancellation, and uh, most of the NGOs and CEOs in Zambia we are calling for debt cancellation, and uh, since. Uh, Zambia applied for the G20 framework. See, we never heard from them. So we are pushing so that maybe we can have the structure. And uh, more youth activists, they are fighting for date cancellation. We just need support from the global north so that we can, our date can be canceled. Yes. Sure. And, and if I can ask you a follow-up question, Precious. So. Yeah. Uh, clearly, there's there's an issue about the amount of debt that might be cancelled. So, um, is there? I, I I would imagine um, having been aware of of what the the, the, the debt uh, justice uh, alliance is doing in in Zambia, which is clearly uh, has a you know a, an ambitious or a high level uh, of debt that they'd like to see cancelled. But I'm I'm guessing that might not always match up with what the Zambian government is calling for. So I'm I'm assuming that it's really important for civil society, whether it's in Zambia or in other countries like in the UK providing solidarity, we need to push our governments, don't we, to be 
uh, to do as much of what we want them to do, because clearly, you know, when it comes to geopolitics and kind of daily realities, they, they might go for the kind of easier option, as it were, what they would consider politically feasible. But in our campaigning, we can push for 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 the for the the highest amount of debt to be cancelled. So I'm, I'm I'm wondering if you if you've met with the Zambian government or, or or if you've seen the amount that they're calling for of debt to be cancelled, and if that is different from what from what the Zambian civil society is is calling for. Uh, yes, uh, for now, uh, we have met uh, with uh, MPs. We are trying to have a lobby day. This uh, this year, so that maybe we can lobby with uh, we can lobby with the parliamentarians, and uh, so that uh, we can push for debt cancellation. And going back to your question, as uh, you say that uh, what date uh, are we calling for to be cancelled? I think we are calling for all the dates we owe to our, all our lenders. It's very important for the date for Zambia to be cancelled. So we are trying by all means to talk to MPs in our country to lobby for debt cancellation in Zambia. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, as we're talking about the role of governments, uh, Tim, I'm going to test your knowledge of Argentina, which I know is extensive. I'm not talking about the culture and the geography, but about its relationship with its creditors over the years. So there's a question here about if Argentina repudiated its debts, why can't others? So that's one for you to deal with much better than I could do. Um, well, I know there is one person um, in the meeting from Argentina, so um, I'll answer the question, but also I am not an expert on Argentina. Um, so Argentina had a big debt crisis in the late 1990s, early 2000s, and then stopped paying at the start of 2002. It, um, I wouldn't say it ever repudiated its debts, but it did stop paying for a few years. And then uh, after three years, they um, reached an agreement with most of their private creditors to cancel 70% of the debt and then pay back the other 30% over coming um, years um, with quite a reasonable interest rate. So, and that actually was a big um, economic success on the figures. Once following the default, um, the economy started to recover, poverty started to fall. And, and then getting this deal, they managed to get a lot of it cancelled. They agreed to pay some of it. There were some of the private creditors, um, some particular vulture funds who would bought the debt during the time when Argentina wasn't paying and they didn't accept that deal. And they sued Argentina in New York. And um, to try and keep cut a long story short, in the end, they got a judgment that said Argentina couldn't pay anyone if they weren't paying them. And it made Argentina default again on the people they'd um, not been paying, they started paying again. Um, the government in Argentina held firm and in, continued to say, no, we're not paying these vulture funds. Why should we pay them in full when we only paid 30% to everyone else? Uh, but then when that government um, lost in the election and um, the Macri government came in, they decided to pay off the vulture funds. They did so by borrowing a lot of new money and that then triggered a whole new debt crisis that Argentina entered in um, 2019. So um, that's the story of Argentina. Why can't others do that? So one of the limitations has been shown with a country just stopping paying, you can then get sued in the New York, in, New Lo in London and cause further problems down the line. Um, but there are other reasons why um, countries don't do it, I think. One is all the morality around debt. Debt is, and we see this in all kinds of debt, um, creditors always like to present debt as this moral thing where you're morally obliged to pay, and it's steeped into our consciences in so many ways. And that means if a government stops paying, it's often presented within a country with by opposition parties as a big moral failure on their part. 
um, rather than the other factors. And so that morality around it means that governments don't like to say, actually, we can't pay. And so they internalize this um, need to um, keep paying. So I think that's one reason. Another is the pariah status that um, countries then get globally. Uh, the uh, <coughs> people across the finance world that um, kind of take joke, laugh about Argentina, um, well, actually, it's 2005 default, 2002 default was really successful, but they like to present it as this um, really ridiculous thing to have done. Uh, and then the finance sector also um, puts out this propaganda that if a country stops paying, they'll never be able to borrow again, which just isn't true. The history, including Argentina, is a prime example of this, that um, banks are incredibly willing to keep lending um, again in the future, too much so from um, often in our point of view. So there are all these pressures put on countries to keep paying. There's probably many more I've not um, mentioned. Now, ultimately, my personal view is that more countries should consider stopping paying and challenging the system, but it is very hard. There's lots of pressures on them. And that's why in the global north, we need to increase the power of debtors to be able to stop paying to challenge the system. Things like the legislation we're campaigning for is all based around trying to increase the power of debtors in their relationships with their creditors. Okay, thank you so much, um, Tim. That was that was a great answer to what was quite a, a big question given Argentina's history um, in, in terms of dealing with its debt. Um, okay, so uh, Mahmoud, if it's okay, I'll, I'll ask you this next question. Um, there's a question about uh, taxes, carbon taxes, taxes on financial transactions, and whether these kind of taxes would be uh, a good way to fund uh, reparations, uh, to fund... Um, things like climate mitigation and adaptation what do you have a view on 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 these types of taxes and if you don't that's absolutely fine um i mean i'm, I'm you know i'm not an economist or an accountant so i can't really speak to the idea of taxes but what i what i would like to suggest as as a me i mean in a deeper level or a more systemic level is that our whole economic theory or theorizing or structure is broken. So the idea of grants or tax breaks or something are like plasters on a huge, huge cut. Um, that's not gonna really fix our current uh, climate change, climate challenges and, and um, global warming challenges. I don't, I don't think we can do that with tax breaks and grants and so on. I, I can't see how it's possible. It's like you're trying to put a cost on clean air or, or trees or food. Um, and I'm, I'm so, something I always thought about is that, all right, this economic theory or structure that we have evolved around the 1700s with industrial age, industrial revolution, and the idea of you know capitalism and, and a, 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 almost an endless boundary of future production and consumption. I think we reached a point where that road has run out and maybe this is a moment where we need to change the entire economic theory and, and thinking. Uh, how do we create a more just world uh, and so on? Part of the problem where the debt is, is in the colonies. Argentina, a Spanish colony, Barbados, a former English colony. And you have some structural problems there. One, corruption, bad governance or underdeveloped structures are purposefully underdeveloped structures. I mean, these are conversations that we need to have in the developing world as well. Uh, how are we going to change our education system? How are we going to change our governments, governance systems? So I think like, I can't answer the question in terms of tax cuts or grants and so on, because that's outside of my um, knowledge base. But what I see deeper is that the system is broken and we need another financial construct or system that helps us to really fix our climate and, and um, climate challenges and a big, big underdevelopment between the North and South. 
Thank you, uh, Mahmoud, uh, for, for, yeah. I didn't answer your question, no. sorry. That's <laughs> fine, that's absolutely fine. This isn't a job interview, it's all good. Um, so as uh, you mentioned corruption and it, it's come up in one of the questions as well, um, Precious, I, I wanted to, to maybe to ask you uh, about this. Uh, I know when I've done uh, media interviews or, uh, you know, or even speaking, uh, yeah, spoken to, you know, Catholic supporters, th this issue do does come up. And my answer is that um, uh, CAFOD, uh well, works in many countries, but in, in Zambia, we've, we've, we've supported Caritas Zambia, uh, the Jesuit Center for Theological Reflection, uh, and, and others to, to, to do that work in holding uh, the Zambian government to account in terms of when debt is taken on, uh, how funds are used, and that, that, that part, which is the, the governance and accountability, is fundamental to, to, the, to the conversation and to, to making this a coherent demand for debt cancellation. We, don't, we can't just have debt cancellation without dealing with um, uh, the, the importance of transparency and governments being accountable to their citizens. I'm wondering if these are conversations that you've been part of with the Zambian government or with other Zambian civil society about uh, yeah, holding the government to account for the debt that's taken on and 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 how how that those resources are used. Uh, I think uh, I didn't get clear of your question, but uh, I will respond uh, to what I've heard because uh, I've I've um, I've been into this campaign since last year, and uh, I've been. Uh, Having workshops with uh, on governance with uh, Christian Women Association in Zambia to put uh, politicians accountable or whatever they are doing in uh, our country, and we are also demanding for transparency for our government because. Uh, we need uh, political will for everything that we are doing so that we can uh, have uh, everything on the map. And um, coming back to our government, since uh, everything is channeled to, to date, date and uh, climate. Uh, so we just need more recruitment on uh, on more people so that they know that uh, the debts and the crime they are interlinked. More people don't know that uh, why we are suffering this is because of the debt. So we are trying to have more workshops and uh, sensitization on that. Thank you. Thank you, Precious. And sorry if my uh, question wasn't uh, completely clear, but, but as you said that raising that citizen awareness, it can be fundamental to um, holding uh, government to account in terms of debt that's taken on and and what it's what it's used for um so just to turn to you tim because i'm guessing uh you well i know you've had contacts and meetings with uh people from the imf from the uk government etc have have you ever had the experience that that those institutions or the uk government have brought up the issue of corruption uh as an excuse not to meaningfully engage on on debt relief is that something that you've experienced? It's um, actually not a argument that is um, used much at the moment on the debates are, that are happening um, around um, debt cancellation with those governments. Um, the US tends approach is to try and blame everything on China. And there is some substance that China, China is one of the lenders and China has been going slow on um, debt relief for the countries that have um, requested it, like Zambia. But that is in the context where the Western private creditors are owed more money. They did not suspend any debt payments during the COVID pandemic when China did. And now China is very concerned that they might end up giving debt relief again and the Western private creditors don't. So actually the thing that would unblock international debt negotiations is if the US and UK made their <coughs> private companies take part in debt relief. And in um, the UK, they, they have even a 
less of a developed answer than that in some ways. They say that it can just be led to the voluntary action of private creditors, that they'll take part in debt relief in the end. We just need to be patient. Um, and so that's why they um, say they're not doing the willing to um, make private creditors act at the moment. Um, one story on the um, corruption and why actually corruption is a further reason why um, debt should be cancelled. I think I mentioned briefly in um, 2013, two banks in London lent $2 billion in secret to some companies in Mozambique. And it was all a front on the part of the bankers and the comp another company and the politicians involved to steal the money. And it plunged Mozambique into a huge debt crisis that is estimated to have cost um, people 10 to 15 billion dollars in total. And campaigners in Mozambique have been very clear that those are debts that they had no say over, no control over, so they should not have to pay them. It's not their debt. It's entirely the people responsible are the banks and the politicians, not the um, people of Mozambique. And so um, there are um, some of these um, kinds of deals happen, but it's a further reason why debts need to be cancelled. And it's the in the global north, we have to recognise um, our role in it, the role of London banks, the failure of the UK to regulate them properly. And so why we also need um, regulations to make them act transparently and accountably so that um, to prevent those kinds of deals happening again in the future. Okay, thank you so much, Tim. We're now coming towards the end of this webinar. Um, so thank you so much for everyone who is attending. I'd just like to have a quick chat if possible with Heidi about some of the questions that come up about uh, what we can do in the UK um, and yeah, you know, what can be most effective. And I thought um, just to give you a difficult one at the start, um, which is about the broader financial system. This is a great question that, that's come in about, um, how can we campaign to to affect that that broader financial system uh, to prevent this uh, these debt crises multiple uh, happening again? So uh, you can try and answer that. So good luck. Uh, thank you, Dario, and thank you for giving me such a great question. Um, <laughs> so you know, as campaigners that work on debt, we are really keen to. Um, so I'm just gonna. Take this message off that's come off. Hang on, I'm judging you. Uh, later. Sorry, just sorry, there was a big message coming off my screen. I need to get rid of it so I can concentrate. Um, yeah, I think in terms of this question about how do we um, try to have any impact or influence of the global financial architecture, um, I think as debt campaigners, we do our part in terms of the debt part of the, the bigger. Um, system and so the, the 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 campaign that we're talking about this evening i think has a really big role because we are you know i think the the legislation if we were to win this legislation i think would have a really big impact in terms of um trying to change the incentives in the system that tim's talked so much about this evening and and uh, if we can change those incentives and actually um force private lenders like banks and hedge funds to actually come to the table take part in debt cancellation and actually Take responsibility for the risk that they've taken then actually that will change some of the incentives in the system to prevent future reckless lending so that's kind of our contribution i think as a as debt campaigners um but of course you know the 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 system our global economy is based on a system where the rules are completely rigged in the favor of global north um uh, uh, global north governments and their allies in um in the corporate world um, and with wealthy elites as well. And so actually, if we want to actually change the, the, the global system, we also work in solidarity with other movements as well. Um, and to find those intersections where our issues touch other issues. So I'm really excited about Mahmoud's contribution this evening. Um, before I joined Debt Justice, I spent many years working on food sovereignty and as a food sovereignty campaigner and actually seeing those links and making and joining up those dots is where we can really build our power. So um, it's great that we are also talking about debt and food sovereignty, but also debt and climate. Um, and, and, you know, and, and during the pandemic, we talked about debt and health justice. Um, and so I think that's how we can 
um, yeah, begin to have some kind of influence on the world that we're seeing around us that we that is hugely um, damaging and devastating for communities, especially in the global south. Okay, thank you, Heidi. That was a great answer. I will ask you in a minute about uh, what we can do uh, as campaigners in the UK, and and that's where um, you, you can talk about you know the, the general campaign we're doing. But there is just a great question that's just come in that just asked for your quick reflection on, which is about you just mentioned that um, in a way the things are set up is basically to benefit corporates. There's wealthy elites in behind, etc. And so there's this question here about I'll just read it out: Are UK politicians and banks uh, too close to each other, um, as in, you know, it's revolving door between uh, people getting jobs in either uh, politics or in the financial sector. And I just wondered if you wanted to just reflect on that in terms of what we're up against. Yeah, I think uh, it's a really good point. I think that um, I've worked on a whole range of issues um, over the years on economic justice issues and what I found on every issue that I've worked for is this uh, like this collusion collusion of the elites are actually we find that so in this, for example, in the finance sector, we see that actually uh, people from the world of finance end up getting jobs in government and vice versa. Governments end up uh, pe previous uh, ministers, politicians end up working in the banks. And so you see this kind of revolving door um, situation um, where uh, but it's not just it's not just the moving of the revolving door and the, and, the, and the kind of the the musical chairs kind of scenario that we see in terms of the the por por porosity between the, the the kind of the uh the connections between the world of government and the world of corporations um but we also see it in things like um uh, uh you know bankers and governments tend to have their kids going to the same schools and they end up having lunch together and playing golf together so there's this real um so yeah so so that's that's the system that we're up against we're not just up we're, we're not just up against corporate capture we're actually against we're up against the whole kind of corporate culture where actually there's this um un um where this kind of unspoken um culture in government that what is good for corporations is good for the country is what is good what is the corporate good equals public good and of course as campaigners we know that is completely untrue um and so i feel like this is the knowing the knowing that this is how the uh, the rules of the game have been set up for me that actually gives, makes me even more um, angrier but also makes me even more determined to actually take action um, on, on, on some of these issues that we can really have an influence on and I think this this is why I'm so excited about the, the legislation campaign because actually as Tim was saying earlier actually if we are in a key jurisdiction for debt contracts uh, so as UK campaigners we are uniquely placed to be able to um, uh, influence our decision makers, our, our MPs and our politicians to actually uh, see this idea that actually if we could pass a legislation in the UK context, in the UK Parliament, it would have a, it would have a, a disproportional impact um, on debt contracts across the world. Um, so yeah, so I would say, yeah, that actually use this knowledge of, uh, of how the system is set up to spur you on to take more action to uh, win economic justice for um people impacted by these policies that we see across the world okay thank you so much Heidi and so yeah final question which is probably the one you were going to answer anyway is what can we do uh, now as a campaign as somebody put could we do direct action um you mentioned uh golf clubs so do we need to get a sponsorship what's the uh what's the thing we need to do next yeah, no, it's a great question um, because, and I was hoping, and I was hoping, as I, I wanted to wrap up this session anyway, to kind of outline what we can do because, like any good campaign, like any good campaign, we don't just want you to know about the campaign. We want you to actually take action with us. And so I really encourage everyone to get involved. And I'm going to sort of summarize the set of things that you can do. And I'll just also post it up um, on the chat as well because there's some links there. Um, but yeah, so you can, so first of all, you can read more about this issue um i've put up a couple of links um to places where you can read a little bit more about how this legislation could work um we've got a blog post and a briefing which with more policy detail for anyone who wants to really delve into the detail um of how this legislation would work um we've also got some actions um that people can take part in so we are trying to at the moment trying to um call on as many MPs as possible to write to Andrew Mitchell, who is the International Development Minister, um, to really demonstrate the public pressure that is building on this issue, with both with MPs and with government as well. And as Tim mentioned earlier, Andrew Mitchell has actually, um, hasn't, you know, has made some kind of 
so, sort of friendly noises towards the idea of, of keeping an option of legislation on the table. So we, we feel that, that that is definitely um, an area that we want to push on. Um, and if you want to go one step further, you can also arrange to actually meet your MP to talk about this, um, actually meet uh, uh, constituency meetings um, with MPs tend to be much more um, uh, impactful than just sending an email. So if you have time um, to do that, then do um, uh, fill in the link that I've just posted on the chat, um, because we can send you some resources to help you to do that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, our campaign is also our, our campaigns are all supported by individuals, activists, and supporters. So, if you want to find out more about giving, then do check out our donate page. And then, if you want to receive updates um, on the campaign as well as our latest actions, do sign up to our mailing list as well. And those links are all on the um, on the on the chat that I've put up. Um, in terms of protests and direct actions, then I th I think that these kind of um, there are some key opportunities coming up um, in the in the autumn months um, uh, in terms of uh, external um, meetings. So, for example, we have the annual meetings of the IMF and World Bank, uh, which is taking place in October. That's also that's a really good opportunity to really highlight these issues. Um, we've also got the COP28, um, so that's the International Climate Summit, which is taking place at the end of the year in December um, in the UAE, but there will be solidarity actions taking place across the UK. Um, and in terms of targets, I would say UK government and MPs, we want MPs to start building, we want um, to start preparing for a potential change of government, so we want to be seeding this idea with opposition parties so that when they come into government, uh, that actually, you know, to my, when they come into government, that, that actually that they're, they're, the idea is already there, um, and then, um, and then the, the UK government the current UK government, we don't, you know, we don't realistically see them taking up this um, legislation, but the UK government does play a key role in a lot of the multilateral spaces where uh, debt is talked about. So um, IMF, World Bank, G7, G20, uh, and so on. So actually keeping up the pressure on the UK government is also really, really helpful. So I hope that gives you a, a kind of a uh, uh, and sort of ideas on what uh, what we can do um, together in this campaign, but also we're really open to ideas that you have as well. So do feel free to add in the chat other right campaigning ideas that you think can help push this idea of a campaign. But also if uh, yeah, but also feel free to email us or, or uh, tweet at us or you know contact us, contact us through social media if you've got other ideas around the campaign. We're really open to to hear other people's ideas as well. Um, yeah, so thank you for that. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, uh, particularly to our speakers, Mahmoud, Precious and Tim. And uh, also thank you to everyone at Debt Justice and CAFOD who's organized this and done all the behind the scenes work. So um, I think we'll leave it there. And um, as you've clearly seen, we need to keep up the pressure. So your uh, presence and your energy and um, willingness to to carry on and to uh, you know to to do this with us is is really very much appreciated and we we will get the change we want to see so take care everyone see you later